God is good, right? How many times have you heard a chief of police stand on a stage and say, God is good? Because God plays an important part in my life every single day. And I like saying that. A lot of people that wear the uniform are afraid to say that. But God has put me here today for a purpose. I'm going to tell you, um, Jesse called me about 11 o'clock today and said, are you still going to be able to make it? We're tracking. Everything's good. And I wanted to tell her, no, I'm wore out. I'm tired. I just got off an airplane, and can we reschedule? But I couldn't do that. Um, and I'm glad to be here tonight. And, and the reason I had such a long day is Monday afternoon, I worked Monday. I got on an airplane. I flew to Little Rock, Arkansas, to the university. Uh, they have a satellite campus there. I taught a class all day, a drug-endangered children class, which I love to teach. I'm very passionate about it. And then it was a 24-hour turnaround. I had to get on a plane and come back. My plane got stalled in Little Rock. I sat on the tarmac for an hour and a half. I missed my connecting flight in Dallas. I spent the, the night in the airport last night in an uncomfortable chair all by myself, me and the janitor. Couldn't sleep a bit. Hadn't had any sleep in 36 hours. And so I'm working on adrenaline and coffee right now. So if I shake really bad, that's the caffeine in me, okay? Um, but I was sitting here watching you guys worship tonight. And that spirit of being tired and wishing I could go home and, and crawl in bed and try to get some sleep, it was gone. And that's the way God works. It's pretty impressive. And so I'm really, really glad to be here tonight. And I'm not going to sit up here and tell you uh, a lot of police jargon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my story with you. Because honestly, I'm one of the very last people that you could imagine would be not only a police officer, but a chief of police. And so God has a plan for us. Do you realize that? Do you realize right now? That God has a plan for you. And that you're walking in his plan right now. I'm going to tell you, my, uh, I never wanted to be a police officer a day in my life. Not until I was 24 years old. My first encounter with the police department was the Hot Springs SWAT team kicking the door in on the house that I lived in with my mother and stepfather. I was five years old. And... Uh, playing in a floor about like this. The front door's right there, and I'm sitting in the floor. And I've got an epic battle going on with cowboys and Indians. Everybody, you remember, well, you guys are so young, you may not remember this, but they used to make cowboys and Indians. They sold them in a plastic bag, about a dollar a bag. And they were about this big, and I had about ten bags of them. And I had an epic battle going on in the floor right here. And the Indians were just fixing to win. And the door comes blowing off the hinges. And the SWAT team runs in. They arrested my mother and my stepfather for selling drugs because that's what they did. Never worked a day in their life that I can remember. They sold drugs. And so, as a five-year-old, I'd seen so much in my life, even to that point, that I wasn't worried about them putting handcuffs on my mom and my stepdad. You know what I was worried about? Absolutely. They stepped on my cowboys and Indians. That's what I was worried about. I'd seen so much, even at that early point in my life. And one of the things I remember about that night is, right now, to this very day, I can remember they took me to a police car and set me in the back of the police car and waited for my grandmother to get there to pick me up. And I remember the blue lights. If you've ever, ever been out on a, a scene at night and you've seen the blue lights, how they kind of flash through the night, I remember that, sitting in the, that police car. Again, I wasn't worried about... My mom or my stepdad going to jail, I was worried about my cowboys and Indians. My grandmother came and, and picked me up that night, and my grandmother's the person that introduced me to Christ and, and took care of me the majority of my life. But in the 70s, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty old, I may not look it, but I'm actually pretty old. But back in the 60s and the 70s, it didn't matter how bad your mom was, you weren't ever going to get taken away from her. So she gets arrested, she gets out of jail, I go right back to the same situation. And I live in that environment until I'm about 12 years old, seeing just countless things. Spent the weekends with my grandmother, but every week I would go back to my mom's house, go to school. You know, I was that kid that had rustler jeans on and Walmart tennis shoes and the kids made fun of, and it, it was pitiful. 
You know, when I was a kid, we had a Frito-Lay guy that delivered Fritos and uh, Hostess cupcakes and that kind of stuff. And, and my brother and I, he knew the situation my brother and I were in, so he would drop off a used box or an out-of-date box of, of Hostess cupcakes about once a week. It's the best day of the week. Best day of the week. Ding-dongs and milk. I mean, the ding-dongs might have been stale, but they were really good. They were really good. So this rocks along until I'm about 12 years old. And uh, I'm in sixth grade. Sixth grade. And I come home from school one afternoon, and my mom is higher than a kite. I mean, just she's, she's just literally out of her mind. And we have this argument that she wants me to change my name. She wants me to give up who I am and take my stepdad's name. And we get into this argument, and she slaps me right here. She reached back in Mississippi somewhere and came all the way through Arkansas and slapped me. It was hard. You can see it coming. And I told myself I couldn't do that any longer. And so the next day I come home, she's passed out on a couch with a needle in her arm. She loved methamphetamine, and so she was passed out, and I packed everything I had in a black garbage bag, walked out the door, and walked to my grandmother's, and I lived with my grandmother for the rest of my teenage life, and my grandmother took me to church religiously. Now, you know, I went because I had to go. It wasn't always the greatest thing, didn't always want to be there, but she took me. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. And she probably saved my life. Because if I hadn't, hadn't left my mother and stepfather's house, then that environment would have took me. And all of you have friends. You know, you know what I'm talking about. They stay in that environment. They give into that lifestyle. And the next thing you know, they're doing the same thing that their peer group's doing or their mom and dad's doing. So my grandmother, I really feel like, saved my life. And... Uh, Fantastic woman. Loved her to death. So I rock on, go through high school, play sports, do all the things that you, you really truly enjoy in high school. Had uh, scholarships to go to, the, to a number of universities. And, but I wanted to go to West Point. I wanted to go to the military academy. And so one Saturday morning, I get this letter, and it's, it's, a, it's from a congressman. And I'm thinking, all right, I got my appointment. I'm going to go to West Point. I open it up, and you know what it says? says, you're good, but not good enough. We're going with the other guy. And so I go down to the recruiter's office. And I'm 17 at the time. And I go down to the recruiter's office. And the only door that's open is the Marine Corps. And he's dressed in his dress blues. And he sells me a crock. I mean, he tells me it's going to be the best decision of my life. Next thing you know, I'm in the Marine Corps. I turned 18 in boot camp after I graduated. Now, realistically, it was a great thing. It, it, it gave me a lot of discipline and made me who I am. But I saw combat as a 19-year-old Marine in the first Gulf War. And God had his hand on me then, too. He protected me through all of that, protected me through my Marine Corps career. I come out again, never want to be a police officer, all right? So I'm not a police officer yet. And come out of the Marine Corps, and I go into the construction business. That's what my family did. My grandfather and my father loved it. I love building things. I still build things today. Uh, And I really enjoyed it. And so in 1995, I'm on top of a house setting trusses. And there's very few people in this room that's going to understand this. But my pager went off, okay, and I look at it, I look at it, and it's my dad. So I climb off the house, and I go to my truck and get my bag phone. Anybody know what a bag phone is? Have you all seen them in a museum? There you go, you know. Antenna pops up. It cost like two ninety nine a minute to talk back then, and uh, I called my dad. And my uncle was a police officer in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And that day, February twelfth, he was serving a warrant, and he was shot and killed. And uh, I go through the funeral process. Me and my family go through the funeral process with the police department, and it's a very humbling experience to see how police officers bond together. When one of their own pass away. When one of their own is killed. And so I go through this process with my aunt and my cousin and my family. And the day of the funeral, we're driving down Central Avenue, which is the main strip. It's, it's May River Road of Hot Springs. 
or Bluffton Parkway, whatever you want to call it, it's the main strip. And we're going down, and there's this one spot where you can see a mile in front of you and a mile behind you, and there's nothing but blue lights. There's nothing but red and blue lights and people paying tribute to my uncle's sacrifice. And that very minute, sitting in that car with my, my cousin and my family, I knew that this is what God wanted me to do. And I knew it right then, right there. Before we put Chris, his name was Chris also. Before we put my Uncle Chris on the ground, God spoke to me that day, right then and there. Now, I had a struggle with it because, look, he'd just been killed, right? So how do I tell my family that this is the career path that I want to go down? And so we rock along for about 30 days, and I'm struggling with it. I've got a young son, just born, um, married, hadn't been married a year. I've got a fairly successful construction company that I'm going to walk away from. But before I do that, I have to call my aunt and get her blessing. Who would want to make that phone call? And so I call her. And I say, Aunt Kathy, I've, I've been praying about something. I feel I need to do this. Could I have your blessing to test to be a police officer? And it was complete silence. And I think, she's going to say no. She's going to tell me, you're absolutely crazy to want to do that. And she says yes. And so about six weeks later, I test for the police department with 165 other people. I come out number one on the list, I get hired, and it was the best decision I ever made in my life. Was it easy? Absolutely not. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been beat up, I've been drugged behind a car, I've been hit in the head, lost sight in one eye, went blind, uh, I've been in a shootout, I've done anything and everything you could ask to do in this career, but it's what God wanted me to do. So I rock along and uh, going back to my mom. Didn't have a whole lot to do with my mom. I'm on a SWAT call out, um, getting ready to go in. And we've got an armed robbery, our armed robber that's crawled up into the ductwork of a store. And the dog can't go get him, so we're going to go get him. So I'm climbing up on a ladder, and my lieutenant calls me down and says, Hey, Chris, I need to talk to you. And I come down. I'm like, Let me go get the bad guy first. I mean, that's what we get paid for, right? I'm all dressed up. You know, let's go to the prom. And uh, he says, Chris, your mom has died of an overdose. Um, she never quit. She never quit. She died of an overdose. My stepfather died of a heart attack because he liked cocaine, and his heart couldn't take that anymore. So they never left that environment. My little brother, this is one of the regrets of my life. My little brother was eight when I was 12, and I left. He wasn't home that day. I should have waited around for him and took him. But... He didn't leave. He stayed in that environment, and uh, he's been strugg he struggles with addiction today. He's doing very well today, but he struggled with addiction because he stayed, and that would have been my life if I, my grandmother hadn't interceded and, interceded and gotten me out of there. So 2007, my mom passes away. My stepdad's gone. I struggle with my little brother. I have to actually put my little brother in jail to get him clean because he struggled with so much. But I gave in to what God wanted me to do. I knew that God had called me to do this. And I stuck it out. I was the last person that ever should have been wearing a badge and a gun. I beat the odds, but I beat the odds because I gave in to his will. With a lot of help from my grandmother. Um, my career rocked on. I had the opportunity to uh, run a drug task force, a regional drug task force, which I was very passionate about, obviously, right? I didn't want to, I didn't want to see any more of those kids get their little cowboys and Indians stepped on. Now, I stepped on some because I kicked a few doors into my life, but, you know, I wanted to try to make a difference. So, so God really blessed me in my career. I got to run a drug task force for about eight years. That was, I had state police, county, uh, federal agents, everybody assigned to me, really felt like I made a difference. Um, thought I was right where God wanted me. And then he opened another door. And I made lieutenant. And I made captain. I made assistant chief. And I had the opportunity to influence 
a lot of people. Had the opportunity to start teaching, which I love to do, to, to teach drug programs and to teach different programs that help people and help them make their decisions that, that lead them in the right direction. And every time I've hit a wall in my life, I simply slowed down and let God take control. You ever feel like you're in control? You ever say, I've got this? God's really got this. Yeah, you know. Every time I've hit a wall, I've slowed down and I said, God, it's not my way. It's not my will. It's yours. Take control. And he's led me to the next chapter in my life. Eight months ago, I thought I was done in my career. I had 27, 28 years in law enforcement in Arkansas, and I could retire. And my son is stationed. My oldest son's 24 years old, and he's in the Army, and he's stationed right down the road at Fort Stewart. And we were coming out here visiting him and, and, and staying in Savannah. And I thought to myself, I said, you know something? If a job ever opens up out here, it might not be a bad place. Lo and behold, I go back. I'm eligible for retirement. I put in my retirement papers, and Bluffton, Bluffton's chief of police job opens up. And my wife said, we were just having this conversation. And so I fill out the application. And again, God's in control. I'm not. I'm not worried about it. I fill out the application. I send it in. Eighty-something people apply for this job. I get a phone call. I'm in the top 12. We do an interview over the phone, video Skype. I'm not a Skype person. First time I've ever done a video interview over Skype. I think I had the screen like right here and my head was this big and they were all, you know, normal. So how I made it past that level of the interview, I don't know because I was probably pretty goofy. But I did 12, the top 12. And then I get a call, I'm in the top five. And they bring us out here and they put us through this grueling interview process. Next thing you know, I make top two. And they bring me and my family out here. And at this point in time, this is real. This is real. And I'm like, God, I may be moving halfway across the country. Is this right? And so every stumbling, every time we hit a roadblock, God moves that roadblock. Because I let him be in control. My wife and I, my children and I, we just prayed the entire time that if this is your will, let it be done. And so they brought, us, they brought my entire family out here when it was just down to two of us. And uh, they put me in a room about this size with about 150 people in a public forum. Now, who would be nervous? Uh, I was nervous. I went to, so, all right, don't take this wrong, but I went to the bathroom, and I'm standing there, and I'm about to hyperventilate. I'm like, you know. What am I getting myself into? The town manager walks in, puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, breathe. It'll be all right. And you know what? I, I think to myself, I'm standing there in front of the mirror. I'm, I'm blue in the face, got a tie on that's about to choke me. And I say, you know something? It's going to be all right. I'm going to give it to you, God. And so I go out there, and I'm sitting next to the guy that's running for this position with me, and they just start firing questions at us, left and right, left and right. And... Uh, I don't even know what I said. Tell you the truth, I, don't, I have no idea what I said, but apparently it worked because I'm here today. Uh, I do remember this. Somebody in the audience said, uh, Mr. Chapman, if you get the job, how long do you plan on staying? And this is the only answer I remember. The former chief before me only stayed for 10 months, and there, there's quite a bit of talk about him just coming in and staying for a short period of time. So they said, chief Ch or Mr. Chapman, how long will you stay? And I, I just... Right off the cuff, I promise you I'll stay longer in 10 months. The town manager's eyes got about that big. I thought, man, I just lost this job. <laughs> but it worked out. It worked out. And I thought my, my, my opportunity to lead and influence, to tell my story from this position had ended. But it hadn't. God opened another door for us another chapter for us to be able to lead the Bluffton Police Department, to work with the community here in Bluffton, to, to reach people that, that I, I don't have relationships with and build relationships. 
another God thing. I love it. I absolutely love this town. Uh, my family is still in Arkansas. I have two young men who are the same. Who are my seniors? So I have two seniors right now. And so we had made the agreement that if I come here, they would finish school in Arkansas and graduate, which is the right thing to do. But look, I'm 900 miles away from my wife and kids. It's been a long six months. And uh, again, God is in control, has opened the doors. We've been able to, to make it work. We see each other about uh, every couple of weeks. They either come out here or I get to go home. And so God's still taking care of us, still in control. Now, how does God take control of your life? Anybody know the answer to that? You got to let him. You do. You got to realize that it's not about you and you're really not in control, but it's, it's God. God has the plan and you have to allow him to work through you. You have to give him control. When you hit that brick wall, it's usually because you're stubborn. It's usually because you're not letting him drive. You're trying to drive the ship yourself. And so when you meet challenges in your life, and I've met a lot of challenges. Look, my challenges started when I was five and my, my cowboy and Indian battle got interrupted. When you meet challenges, take a knee. Take a knee. Pray about it. Find a mentor. Find somebody you can pray with. Find somebody that will pray for you. Anybody have a prayer partner? No? I encourage you to find one. Pastor does. Find somebody that you can share your problems with that will pray for you. I have two Bibles on my desk. One that's a police Bible and one that I, that's my torn pages and highlighted and, and uh, really worn Bible that I read every day. Get into God's Word. How many of you look at God's Word every day? Whether it's on your phone, a tablet, a Bible. There you go. It's one of the most encouraging things you can do. Just open a page, any page. There's something good on that page. And it's usually the right page. If you'll open it, it's usually exactly what you need to hear at that exact moment in time. Read your Bible. Pray about things. Let God be in control. And when you hit that brick wall, know that it's just a pause in life. It's not, it's not something that you can't overcome. It's not something that God isn't working on you with. We're all going to have problems. We're all going to find roadblocks. It's just part of life. It's how you overcome those roadblocks that help develop who we are. I could have gave in. I could have decided that day my mom slapped me and I come home and she had the needle in her arm that I'd just go to my room and hang out like I usually did and continue down that path. But I didn't. I didn't give in to what was there. I fought through it. Let God work in my life. Allowed my grandmother to impart wisdom in me and, and, and God's love into me. And it made me who I am today. And uh, that may all be cheesy to all of you. I don't know. That's my story, though. And I'm, I'm one of those guys that shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I shouldn't be where I'm at. I shouldn't have had all the opportunities I've had. But it was part of God's plan, even when I didn't realize it. I want to read a scripture to you that's one of my favorite scriptures. And y'all can make fun of me because I'm going to put my old man glasses on. And they say it right on the end of my nose, just like an old man. So it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. What happens when you lean on your own understanding? It's like leaning against the wind. You just kind of fall down. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge that God is in control. Acknowledge Him. And He shall direct your path. That's pretty, that, that's pretty important to realize. It's pretty important to understand that. We're not nearly as smart as we think we are. It's not our plan. It's his plan. And when you allow him to work through you, great things happen. 
I've had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool things. High speed, low drag is what we call it. I've, I've been a SWAT guy. I've been a commander. I've worked drugs. I've done. I, I've chased bad guys all the way down the Mexican border and back. And uh, I wouldn't have had those opportunities if I hadn't let God work in my life. I've got three amazing kids, a wonderful wife, uh, the opportunity to serve a new community. You know, something I had the opportunity to speak to you tonight. That's part of God's plan, whether you like it or not. God put me up on this stage tonight to share with you. And uh, if nothing else, I want to tell each and every one of you, thank you for allowing me to be part of your community, allowing me to stand on this stage tonight, as tired as I am, as long as 36 hours as I've had. Thank you for letting me be here tonight with you guys. Thank you. Pastor. Wow, aren't you not glad that the chief of police in our town here, uh, who, who serves us in incredible ways, whether you realize that, think about that or not, and has authority over us in many ways, is looking to another authority for everything that the decisions that he makes and the, you know, the, the orders and things that he gives. That's, that's rare, and that's pretty, pretty awesome uh, just to think about. It. And he had, Chief Chapman, thank you so much. He had so many great things to say about not only his story, but just what happens, you know, in, in our lives. It, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a freshman or you're a senior here tonight and what career path you choose. God honestly doesn't care whether you're a police chief or you're a youth pastor or you're a janitor or you're a doctor or whatever whatever profession you may choose or find yourself in is really not important. The question is, have you talked to God about what you're going to do with your life? That, I think, is so much more important than what you actually do. We make such a big deal about what we're going to do. and We major in that in college or we go to you know, technical school to pursue, you know, some kind of skill, and then we run with that, and, you know, yeah, I get it, that's important, but we do that, some of us having grown up in church and youth group blindly and never even honestly consult God and what He would have us to do. That's totally missing the point. That's like people who sit in church every week and hear about God and Jesus, but have never actually invited Jesus to come into their life and to take control. And like the chief said tonight, that's the way God can, takes control of your life. You've got to let him. Because in and of ourselves, we'll make our own decisions and we'll call the shots and we'll decide what we're going to do with our life. And Proverbs says that there's a, a way that seems right to a man and the end therein is death. So it doesn't work out well for us, even if we're successful monetarily or by the world's standards. It doesn't work out well for us in the long term if we don't yield to asking God what he would have for us to do in our life. And again, hear me, that's not saying that if you ask God that he's going to just make you a pastor or a missionary or something like that because God uses and and wants people in every career path that are out there that are being a representative for him wherever you go, wherever that is, whatever that looks like. But have you really ever thought about what you're going to do with your life in the context of what's God have to do with that? What's he have to say about that? And I think just having a community leader here sharing a story like that is just a great opportunity for us to think about that and evaluate that in our own life and, and, and say, hey, if I haven't done this before, I'm going to actually start talking to God about this. I'm going to start listening to hear what God has to say. And yes, yeah, through open doors, closed doors, these roadblocks, the different things, you know, that he was talking about in his story tonight, that's how God speaks through his, through his word, of course, through other godly people, through prayer, a lot of different ways we've talked about it before. But don't just keep going on your path independent of what God has for you, the plan and purpose that he has for every single person here tonight in this room that have heard this amazing story of what God has done with Chris Chapman's life. God, thank you so much that you do have a plan for every person here tonight. Not a one that you don't you have made uniquely and for a purpose. And so I pray tonight that students who have heard this story will be challenged and encouraged to look to you. And we're all going to hit roadblocks. We're all going to have tough times. Many in this room have endured 
much more than I have endured in my whole life already in their short lives. But Lord, let those times be times that we run to you and not away from you. Let those be times where we get on our knees, as Chief Chapman said, and we call out to you and say, what are you, what are you doing here, God? What are you saying? What do you want from me? Instead of just running the opposite direction and giving you the stiff arm. Because you never said this world would be perfect or our lives would be perfect. You said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. What you've promised is that you'll be with us during the trouble and during the tough times if we look to you. So, God, I just pray for my friends here tonight that through the message of this story, they would be impacted to give their lives to you, to surrender their lives to you, to look to you for the plan that you have for their life right now, where they are, and moving forward down the road. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.